Welcome to GetChemistryHelp.com. My name is Dr. Kent, and in this video, I'm going to teach you about double displacement reactions. Now, these reactions are also sometimes called double replacement reactions, or you might even hear them called metathesis or exchange reactions, but they're all basically the same reaction type. Now, as we saw in a previous lesson, there are five broad categories of reactions, as well as numerous subcategories, but one of the most important are the double displacement reactions. So I want to take a little time here just to explain what these are and how they work. Now basically in a double displacement reaction or a double replacement reaction, you have two ionic compounds and they're normally in aqueous solution and they're going to switch anions to produce two new compounds. Well we know that in an ionic compound the cation is the one that's written first, so that's the positive one, and the anion is the one that's written second, and that's the negative one. So what happens is on the two ionic compounds, they just swap anions. So basically, A was partnered up with X. Now it partners up with Z to make AZ. And B was partnered with Z. Now it partners up with X to make BX. Well, in order for this reaction to occur, there has to be some kind of driving force towards the products. So something is going to have to form. Either a solid, a liquid, or a gas is going to be formed. Now, if everything winds up still aqueous, if all of the reactants are still aqueous and all the products are still aqueous, then really nothing happened. So one way to think about that is, let's imagine we have a, a beaker here and we mix together our AX and our BZ. So I dissolve those up and they're soluble. So I've got my A cations swimming around in here. And I've got my X anions and they're swimming around. And then I dissolve up BZ. So I've got B cations swimming around in here. And then I've got Z anions. So here's my Z anions. Okay, so A and X and B and Z are all dissolved and they're just swimming around. Well, if once the reaction is done and they've all mixed together and they're still just swimming around, if no solid is formed, no liquid is formed, no gas is formed, then really nothing happened. The ions all just dissolved, but there was no new chemical compound made. So instead, we would just write NR. So I could just scratch this out and write NR if everything is aqueous. So let me show you an example here. So silver nitrate combines with potassium chloride. So this is silver nitrate. KCl is potassium chloride. Well, silver was with nitrate. Potassium was with chloride. Basically, we just swap partners. So silver goes with chloride and potassium goes with nitrate. So we think of it as making silver chloride and potassium nitrate. Now we can figure out what the formula for silver chloride and potassium nitrate are. So silver chloride is AgCl, potassium nitrate is KNO3. And our last step is to figure out, well, what is the physical state on this? Is it aqueous, solid, liquid, or gas? So silver chloride is a solid, potassium nitrate is aqueous. Well, the question, of course, is how in the world do you know this? Well, there are some solubility rules that summarize the solubility of different ionic compounds based on what ions they contain. Now, if you follow this link down below to getchemistryhelp.com, you can print out a PDF that has all of these solubility rules summarized on it. But generally, the way it works is, Compounds that contain the following ions are generally soluble in water, or that means they're aqueous. So if you have an ionic compound and it has any of these ions, lithium, sodium, potassium, ammonium, nitrate, acetate, chloride, bromide, iodide, sulfate, they are generally always going to be soluble or aqueous. Now notice there are a few exceptions though that are solids. So lithium, sodium, potassium, ammonium, these don't have any exceptions. Those are always aqueous. Any nitrate compound or acetate compound, almost always aqueous, no exceptions. Chlorides, bromides, iodides, any of those ionic compounds, also aqueous. But there are a few exceptions. So if you had silver, mercury-1, or lead combined with chloride, bromide, iodide, those would be solid, but every other chloride, bromide, and iodide would be aqueous. How about sulfate? All sulfates are aqueous, unless it's calcium sulfate, strontium sulfate, barium sulfate, or lead 2 sulfate. Now the bottom half of the table tells you which types of ions are going to be solid or insoluble. 
So anything with carbonate, chromate, or phosphate is a solid, except, of course, we said anything with lithium, sodium, potassium, and ammonium are always soluble. So even with these, if it has lithium, sodium, potassium, or ammonium, those are all soluble. But any other carbonate, chromate, or phosphate would be a solid. Same with hydroxide or sulfide. These are always solids, except, again, with lithium, sodium, potassium, or ammonium, but also if they're with calcium, strontium, or barium. So calcium, strontium, or barium hydroxide or sulfide would also be soluble, but all other hydroxides and sulfides would be solids. Okay, so let's try a few examples of these. So it tells me to write a balanced chemical equation for the following double displacement reactions. Now again, it'll be convenient for you to have those solubility rules handy, so you can go to getchemistryhelp.com and print those out and have those here in front of you. So, aqueous aluminum acetate is added to a potassium sulfide solution. Okay, aqueous aluminum acetate. Well, we know from our lessons on naming that aluminum is 3 positive. Acetate is C2H3O2 negative. So, aluminum acetate would combine and make Al, parenthesis, C2H3O2, parenthesis, 3. And it already told us it was aqueous. And if you look at your solubility rules, you can see that anything that has acetate is always soluble, aqueous. So that makes sense. And that's added to potassium sulfide. Well, potassium is positive. Sulfide is 2 negative, so that would make K2S. And again, if you look at your solubility rules, anything with potassium is soluble. So that's why it's a solution, so aqueous. Now we're going to predict our products. Well, the wrong way to try to predict the products is just to try to keep the same ratio as the ions originally had. So you can't say originally it was one aluminum and one sulfide, so aluminum sulfide must be one of each. You can't do that. You have to figure it out based off the charges. So now aluminum is partnering up with sulfide. So aluminum 3 positive combining with sulfide 2 negative, what would that be? Well, that would be Al2S3. And if you look on your solubility rules, you'll see all sulfides are solids, insoluble, except for a few exceptions. And aluminum is not one of those, so this is a solid. Then we're also going to combine potassium with acetate. Well, that's K positive, acetate negative, so just one of each. We'll make a neutral compound. And if you look on your solubility rules, all potassium-containing compounds are soluble. All acetate-containing compounds are soluble. So this is definitely aqueous. Well, the last thing we have to do is to balance it. So we'll just go through and use our balancing skills. First off, we're going to identify that there is a polyatomic on both sides. So I'll balance this as one unit. So one aluminum on the reactants, two aluminums on the products. So let's make this two aluminums. Now I've got 2 times 3, 6 acetates on the reactants, only 1 acetate on the product. So we need to make that into a 6. Well, as soon as I do that, that also makes 6 potassiums. So we need 6 potassiums on the reactants. So here's 2. So in order to make 2 into 6, I've got to multiply it by 3. Well, now I've got 3 sulfides, and this has 3 sulfides, so there you go. This reaction is balanced. It looks good. Number two, aqueous barium chloride is added to a sodium carbonate solution. Well, barium is 2 positive. Chloride is Cl negative. So that would be BaCl2. And all chlorides are soluble except silver, mercury, 1, and lead. So that would be soluble. Is added to sodium carbonate. So sodium is Na positive. Carbonate is CO3, 2 negative. So that would make Na 2 CO3 and it says it is a solution because all sodium containing compounds are aqueous so aqueous now we're going to predict our products so barium partners up with carbonate barium carbonate would be BaCO3 and if you look on your solubility rules and find carbonate ion all carbonates are solid except for lithium sodium potassium ammonium that's not any of these so this would be a solid and then sodium will partner up with chloride. So that would make NaCl. And all sodium containing compounds are soluble, so this would also be aqueous. So our last step would be to balance this. So 
one barium on the reactants, one barium on the products. Two chlorides on the reactants, one on the products. We need to make that two. Well, now that also makes two sodiums on the products, and we have two sodiums on the reactants, one carbonate on the reactants, one carbonate on the products. So there you go, that one's balanced too. Last one, aqueous lithium phosphate is added to a solution of potassium sulfate. Well, lithium is Li+, plus. phosphate is PO4, three negatives, so that would make Li3PO4. Any ionic compound with lithium is soluble or aqueous. Is added to potassium sulfate solution. Potassium is K positive. Sulfate, SO4, two negative. So that would make K2SO4. And it tells me it's a solution because of course anything with potassium ion is soluble, so aqueous. Now let's predict our products. So we're going to swap out the phosphate for the sulfate and make lithium sulfate. That would be Li2SO4. All lithium containing compounds are soluble, so that'll be aqueous. And we'll also make potassium with phosphate. Well, all potassium compounds are soluble, so that would also be aqueous. Oh, well look, all the reactants and all the products are aqueous. So what does that mean? That basically means nothing happened. All we have is a bunch of dissolved up lithium, phosphate, potassium, and sulfate ions. So I don't even have to bother balancing this. I can just write NR for no reaction instead. Well, I hope you enjoyed this lesson on double displacement or double replacement reactions. In my next video, I'm going to work several more practice problems on how to predict the products of these types of reactions. So be sure and join me back here next time at GetChemistryHelp.com. And we'll see you then. Thank you.